Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. We're, we're talking about developing spiritual sensitivity, so let's understand the importance of praying for ministries, praying for ministers. Somebody's going to tune in right here on this point and go, what's he talking about? That's okay. It, it kind of gives a good lead in. You just kind of think, whoa, should have been in church that day. Amen. Got the whole. Amen. Now, you understand in our church, when we say amen, it is a, it is a request for you to respond with an amen. amen. We are not the first church of the frozen chosen. Amen. amen. This is not you. When you walked up and says faith and victory church, it didn't say Frigidaire church. <laughs> amen. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to be full of faith in the Holy Ghost. There's supposed to be a fire on the inside of us. John the Baptist said of the Lord Jesus Christ that he that comes after me is mightier than I, and he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, a lot of you have been baptized with the Holy Ghost. Your fire gone out. Amen. We got to get some fire back in us. Amen. Just like fire shut up in my bones. Amen. And so we began ministering out of 1 Samuel chapter 3 where Samuel hears uh, a voice in the night calling him and he gets up and runs over to Eli and Eli and says, hey, I'm here. And Eli says, boy, I said, I said Some, go back to bed. You bother me, boy. You bother me. I could just imagine Eli being like foghorn leghorn, you know. I said, I said, you bother me, boy. About three times he does it. Finally, Eli wises up and goes, hey, it's the Lord. Next time you hear it, go back and say, Lord, here's your servant. Speak. So he does that, God speaks, God says some things, and then the next morning, Eli says, tell me everything the Lord said, and one of the things the Lord said was, I'm going to do the, and bring the judgment on the house of Eli that I told him I was going to bring, and he says, boy, don't hold anything back from me, tell me everything, so Samuel tells him everything, and of course, Eli goes, well, the will of the Lord be done, basically, and the reason the judgment was on Eli's house was his sons were taking advantage of the women at the temple of the gate, and he didn't stop them. Now, see, sometimes we think that people get away with stuff because we don't see, you know, you know, lightning come out of heaven and strike them dead instantly. Let me say something. God keeps good records. And you got people taking it. One of the things the Lord gets more angry about than anything I believe is people in positions of authority, particularly spiritual authority, abusing and taking advantage of the sheep. What makes you think that? Well, God judged Eli's house for what he did. Remember when Jesus went to the temple one day and he, he drove the money changers out and, and overturned the tables and said, you've made, and this, God said, my house should be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And you got people come up and say, well, you got a bookstore in your store. In your church, you're a den of thieves. No, 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 no. What it was is they had a gimmick, they had a gimmick going on. People would bring their lambs in. The priest would go in and say, it's a blemished lamb, but you can buy one of the unblemished lambs over here at the marketplace. And then they, they had no choice but to buy because the priest declared it blemished. And then they'd run that rascal around and put it right in the, the trough with all the other ones, or corral with all the other ones, and sell it to somebody else. They had a, and why? The people had to do. And then Jesus got there and said, you made it a den of thieves. You've got a position, a spiritual position of authority, and you're abusing the people with it. And that's why he ran them all out. So the wimpy Jesus is not the one, you know. He ran the whole bunch out by himself. Hello? He was a, man, man. Oh, yeah, he was a man's man, that's right. He was a carpenter back before power tools. Are you here? You know, now when I build stuff now, I go get my nail gun. You just take your hammer and go bang, 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 bang. bang. And see, that don't work for me because I have to take the nail back out and straighten it out four times. Because I was always bending over. But it's so nice just sitting there going, skapow, skapow. Whoa, praise God. Then you can put it up here and go, skapow, got right, nail, got right through my finger. Do that too. Hallelujah. But you can nail with a nail gun with a, with a taped up finger. That's right. Jesus was a man. I mean, he, was, he was a carpenter before power tools were in. Amen. And so the reason the judgment came on Eli, it didn't happen right away. People think, well, it hey, you know, don't ever think that if you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, you're just going to get away with it. In particular, if it's affecting other people. Amen. Now, God will, will deal with you when your sin doesn't affect others. 
and he'll keep dealing with it. But when it starts affecting others, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Live long and prosper, Kirk. Anyway, I'm sorry. You gotta be a Star Trek fan to get that one. Hallelujah. Now Star Wars, they Star Trek. Hallelujah. The original sci-fi group. All right. So, you know, Samuel, Samuel comes and goes and listens to the Lord. He goes back and tells Eli everything. And in this passage of Scripture here in 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 3, the entire chapter, we found some principles to be developing spiritual sensitivity. Now, in this day we live in, you've got to be spiritually sensitive. You can't be a bonehead. Why? Because there's too much out there fighting for your spiritual attention. Or fighting to dull your spiritual attention. And so we found something. You know, one of the things is, um, the first step was, according to the first one was, you got to minister unto the Lord. Now, in our charismatic word of faith circles, we just think our word of minister unto the Lord means we, we bring in the tambourines and the, the dancing girls and the, and the banners and we worship the Lord all the time. I'm just teasing now. Don't get uptight. If you got banners, uh, Gwen brought her tambourine this morning. I hadn't heard tambourine in a long time. Hallelujah. What? Hadn't played in a long time. When come back, Gwen, Gwen just went to have a reminiscent moment with her tambourine. Praise God. I, I, you know, I like tambourines. We still need 17 of them trying to outdo each other. <laughs> been there for that too before, you know. Let's just, you know, praise God. I mean, I've been in church with Brother Spoons before. He, he played his spoons. Take two spoons, turn backwards and beat them, you know. We call them Brother Spoons. <laughs> yeah, I've seen people come with the washboards. Yeah, now worshiping the Lord, that's, that's fine, Dwayne. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, it's fine. Worshiping the Lord is part of ministering to the Lord. But you know what? It doesn't, it doesn't stop there. Serving the Lord is part of that ministering to the Lord. Because when you look at what Samuel was doing, he was busy about the things in the temple. So ministering in the Lord includes maybe as much or more as worshiping the Lord Serving him, doing his will, carrying out his duties, doing the things you as a believer are supposed to be doing. If you're going to be spiritual sensitive, you know, God's not going to tell you all kinds of stuff and you're sitting still like a knot on the log. Like a frog on the top of a knot on a log. Like a flea on the frog on the top of a knot on a log. You know, some people say, I'm, I'm going to move when God moves me. God's going to move when you move. The story of the prophet in the Old Testament. When, you know, he took up and took off the run. The hand of the Lord came on him. Amen? I said amen. You've got to gird up your skirt and run so the blessings of God can work with you. Amen. So uh, then the second point we've already covered was listen to those older than you and know God's voice. These young whippersnappers come along, and I was one of them at one time. So I can speak from the experience of being a young whippersnapper. Now, young whippersnapper is old country term for young and dumb. Okay, you're young and you think you know everything. See, when you think you know everything, you don't know anything. It'd be like Nathan going into the studio with his, his uh, guitar teacher, and uh, the guitar teacher said, now, Nathan, you do this. What is that? I'm young. I know everything. All right? I got it all together. Are you here? Well, no, he doesn't. Matter of fact, that's why the teacher is there, is to take everything he's learned over decades of playing and learning and, and learning guitar to, to transfer that knowledge to a younger person so they can grow quicker. Amen. And see, if we'll listen to those over us in the Lord, those who are older and who've walked some things out, let me say this. You can learn some things by listening to somebody, or you can learn some things by going through it. And let me tell you something. 90% of the time, it's a whole lot better just to learn it from somebody who's already been there. Amen. Amen. Are you here? Amen. There are some things I've gone through in life because you didn't listen that you'd just rather not. Now, my son will probably tell his kids when they get older, and if rollerblades are still the hot thing, I can guarantee you they won't be going to the park and rollerblading the slide. Will they, Nathan? Nope. Why? Because he didn't listen to experience. He listened to his buddies who were younger than him, younger and dumber. You got young and dumb, younger and dumber, and youngest and dumbest. All encouraging him to catch air on his rollerblades on the slide with their wrist guards, knee pads, or helmet. 
the day before the second round of the High Point Little League playoffs in which he broke his wrist and didn't play anymore and spent our summer, messed up our summer because <laughs> we couldn't get in the pools, had to get in the pool with his arm up and all this kind of stuff. Are you here for six weeks right in the middle of the summer? But now he knows this. You don't roll the blade on slides, particularly without wrist guards on. Am I right? And your children, will you taught that lesson? He, he actually took for a long time, he took the cast, the last cast it took, cut it in half and took all the stuff out of it, and he pinned it to his wall and then printed a sheet. That if you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough and posted it right under it. So he learned the lesson. So, you know, but see, if, 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 in spiritual things, we can learn from those who've gone before and not have to go through some tough places that we would otherwise go if we didn't listen. Amen. I said amen. People get bad with me when I tell them we don't do this, don't do that. Then they have to come back later and say, well, you were right. Well, I don't want to hear I was right. I'd rather just say that you listened to begin with and didn't, and didn't have to go through that. Amen. So listen to those older you that know God's voice. You've walked some things out, experienced some things. And so you don't have to. And our third point we're coming to today is this. We need to continue to spend time with the Lord and grow. You do not arrive. Everybody say, I do not arrive in this life. You will always be learning. You should always be learning. You should always be growing. You should be expanding and extending and stretching yourself. And you continue to spend time in God's presence. Let's look at the verse out, out of this passage here uh, that we used. It says in verse 19, Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Listen, he listened to what the Lord said. Amen. Now, one of the dumbest, you know, you may Say, that's just mean, Pastor Ed. You shouldn't say it that way. You should dress it up a little bit. One of the dumbest things you can do in life is to have the Lord speak to you and you not do it. You go, oh, I don't think I got to do that. And let me tell you what, the first place he speaks to you is right here. Holy Bible. All right. There are people waiting for a revelation, and they won't even do this. They won't even act on what God's already told them to do in the Bible. You know? They're, they're waiting for some angel to show up with a flaming sword with a scroll that glows in the dark. Hallelujah. Call your name and call you my son and, you know, have liquid light from heaven drop all over you. You know, and, and, they don't, and woo, ah, how to, so you can go tell everybody how all this stuff happened in your life. Are you here? You're gone home. And then everybody goes out and just oodles and owls over all those people who've had these, these, quote, supernatural experiences. Now, I know some people do, but there's a lot of people who just make money off of it. One guy supposedly went to heaven and built his ministry on going to heaven and all this stuff. Faith and that lady was just a homosexual. Had, had stepped down out of his church for, for a long time. Yeah, that went over big. Anyway. Everybody bought, his, but everybody bought his tape series on I Went to Heaven. Why don't we just do the Bible? Why don't we do is of the Word first? And if God brings you to other things, that's okay. But, you know, we've got to be doers of the Word first. So if you're going to continue to grow in the Lord, you've got to keep uh, spending time with the Lord. Let's spend time with Him in His Word. Amen. Luke 180, referring to uh, John the Baptist, says, The child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Now, John the Baptist was not a cool-looking guy. He was not the guy you went to because he had this month's power tie. He wasn't the guy he went to that, you know, because he came in. You know, is it amazing what people will go follow after? Some guy gets hot coals and runs across hot coals, lays on nails, and, oh, he's a great motivational speaker. He's got devils. It's not mind over matter that you're walking on hot coals. I've stepped on a hot coal before, and not on purpose. 
When I was in Boy Scouts, we were down, um, we were down near Fort Bacon, near, near uh, Atlantic Beach, near Moorhead City. We were down at a campground down there close to Fort Macon, and we had set up our tents, and we had had our, our, our fire ring with the, we cooked over with coal, you know, charcoal in it, and then covered it up with sand. And I went out barefoot, and, and, and of course it was covered up with sand, didn't see it, walked right over there into the coal, just, just below the surface. Right on the arch of my foot, I got a blister about that big around. Kind of messed up your camping trip, by the way. Hot coals burn your feet. When they don't burn your feet, and you're just walking on them, there's devils involved. We'll go listen to him. Oh, he's, he walked on coals. He, he laid on the bed of nails. They slept, slept on the sedge sledgehammer, and he didn't get cut. I could, you get a paper cut off a piece of paper. It's not motivational speaking. Hello, are you here? People, people want to you know, get all, you know, all of a sudden, we need to just grow in the Lord. Stop looking for some, you know, special thing that's going to make us feel better and just do the Bible. Go witness to people. Share Jesus with people. Tell them about the Lord. Amen. Carry on. Walk the way he said walk. Walk in a way that honors him. I said walk in a way that honors him. And stop trying to find ways around all that, by the way. That's the newest, latest thing is to try to find ways around everything. So, but John, anyway, I said all that because John Baptist wasn't a cool guy. He was eating locusts and honey and lived out in the desert. People went out, people went to the desert to find him. And he wasn't cool. See, we think if you don't have the latest, latest, coolest, greatest, hippest, most slickest, whatever it is, this guy's out in the desert. Probably look like some, uh, uh, probably like uh, Merlin Olson. Remember him? Used to be with the, used to be with the, used to be on the uh, that show. What's that show? The Laura Ingle, Ingle, Laura Ingalls, Little House on the Prairie. Well, he used to play for the, he played for the Los Angeles Rams and, at the time they were in Los Angeles, and was part of what they used to call the fearsome foursome. The front line of the Los Angeles Rams back then was considered the best front four defensive front four in football, and, and you know, and, and it was four guys. Merle Lawson was one of them. Okay, but he has this kind of beard, kind of get this bushy, beardy kind of guy, kind of get this idea of John Baptist, this bushy, beardy kind of guy, you know, living out in the desert, kind of eccentric acting, but people went to see him. What was it they went to see? Someone who spent time with the Lord. See, it's not how cool you are, it is what you've got. Are you anointed? Now, I don't mind, you know, Jesus, Jesus didn't look like that. Jesus didn't try to look like John the Baptist, Okay. Luke 2, 52 says, and Jesus increased in the wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. We got to grow. Peter, 1 Peter 2, 2, uh, Peter says this, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow by thereby. The Amplified says, like newborn babies, you should crave, thirst for, earnestly desire the pure, unadulterated spiritual milk, that by it you may be nurtured and grow unto completed salvation. We got to grow. Stop looking for ways to be uh, Slick and cool and grow in the Lord. Your neighbors, the people you're going to minister to, don't care if you're hip like them. Because let me tell you something. Now, now Nathan had a friend at school he called them. Um, now, they, they, were this, they had piercings all over their face. I mean, ears, front face, nose. I mean, every, anywhere you could stick something, they had them. Now, now Nathan could get, relate with people in a way I just don't get. And, and, and that guy would call Nathan Heartbreaker because he can croon, sing the kind of crooning songs. But Nathan would call him Tackle Box. <laughs> and one day I was there, we were checking him in for the next semester, and, uh, you know, to make sure the bills were all paid and all that kind of stuff. And this guy comes by and goes, and goes hey, crooner. Nathan goes, hey, Tackle Box. And they, they're like, cool with that. I'm like, and now, I don't expect Nathan to come home and pierce up his whole face so he can go minister to him. See, we're foolish when we think we've got to do that. You know? I mean, you know, you're going to go get full sleeves and body sleeves and body art all tattooed all over you, and then that goes out of style. What are you going to do to minister to the group that, don't, that doesn't do that anymore? Amen. See, it's not whether you're tatted or not tatted. It's not whether you've got gauges or do have gauges. It's not whether you're, uh, you know, pierced all over. It's not whether you've got all the cool stuff. You've got the right hairstyle, the right color hairstyle, whether you're emo or whether you're goth or whether you're not, whether you're preppy, whether you're this. It is, have you spent time with the Lord? 
One of the interesting things says that when the Bible says that when they brought the disciples in, remember they, they were preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus, and they brought them in before the council, and they were straightly charged not to teach or preach in the name of Jesus, and they replied to that. And then the Bible says this about the council. They said this. They said they took note of them, that they were ignorant and unlearned men, but they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. They weren't cool. They weren't, they weren't, uh, they weren't eloquent. They didn't have eloquence of speech. Paul, the Apostle Paul, the one person in the, Bible, in the whole entire New Testament who had the right to say, I come with excellency of speech, said this, I came not unto you with excellency of speech, nor enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? That your faith should stand in the wisdom of God and not in the, in the, uh, in the power of God and not in the wisdom of men. If we're going to be spiritually sensitive, we're going to have to be people who are given to the things of God and not trying to be cool. Now, people will mock you. People will make fun of you. People will say all kinds of evil about you. They'll say you're a, you're a Bible toter. You know, they'll say you're a holy roller. I mean, you know, see, growing up in classical Pentecostal, we were called holy rollers, you know, because everybody thought we hung from the chandeliers and rolled out the front door of the church. Now that, you know, rumors get started on you, man. You know, we were holy rollers, you know, Bible thumpers, hate mongers, all kinds of titles you get. But let me tell you who they come to when they find out they got breast cancer. They don't go to the drinking buddy and say, pray for me. Are you here? They don't go to their Satan worshipers and say, what am I going to do? They don't go to the crowd they run around with, you know, bar hopping, looking for a man. Or Joe from Medea goes, you got to call 1-800, choke that hoe, <laughs> choke that hoe. Anybody watch Medea movies? Joe. Joe said, you got 1-800, choke that hoe. Anyway. <laughs> That's not how they're, they're not going to them when they find the lump. You know who they go to? One minute, they're, they're mocking you and calling you brother with an attitude. The next day, they're coming to you and say, I found a, I found a lump in my breast. Why? Because they know you know God. And they know you spend time with God. And they want you to pray for them. It's no longer making fun of you. And you pray for them. Say, so go to the bathroom and check yourself, and it disappears. Are you here? I know this because I had it happen. Coming with all kinds of you know, doctor's reports and you pray for them and, they, and they're healed. And it's not long down the road they come to you and say, I went to church, I got saved last night. I gave my heart to the Lord last night. See, people don't care if you're cool or slick or you got all the, the this. What they care about is, do you have something in their time of need that will help them? Not make them feel better, but will deliver them from the power of darkness. See, cancer, sickness, disease are from the power of darkness. But we've been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. If we're going to be spiritually sensitive, we're going to have to spend time with God so that we know what to do. When people come because we've been spending time with God, we have to hear God's voice and know what to do. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10 through 16 says, He that descended into the, it's talking about Jesus, he, he descended into the lower regions of the earth. It's the same also that ascended up far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting Word perfecting means in the Greek in our language today, modern language. This is you know, older. But that word perfecting means maturing. For the maturing of the saints. What for? For the work of the ministry. God wants you to grow in him so you can do the work of the ministry. God's got, God's got callings on your lives. Maybe it's not a pulpit. You're not, you're not an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. You're a computer operator. But the person next to you is hurting. The person next to you has things.
things that, that uh, I'm not going to get to them with. They've got things going on in their life. They need answers. And I, Pastor Ed's not going to be there to help them with it. But you are. And you sense, see, with spiritual senses. Now, we, we kind of started this out. Uh, some of our emphasis on spiritual sensitivity is watching out for false stuff and false doctrines and bad stuff. But let me bring you to this. Not only do we need to be aware of the, the, the bad stuff and, and, and guard against that, God wants to make us spiritually sensitive so we're aware of people. So that we sit next to them and they're hurting and they're in pain and there's things going on in their life. That this, the wisdom of the Holy Ghost rises up and you're able to reach over and say, you know what? God loves you. He's got answers for your life. And all of a sudden, they just open up that whole book of their life and start sharing everything with you. And, you, and the wisdom of God begins to flow out of you and minister to them. It's amazing what happens to people when you speak by the Holy Ghost to their life. We speak by the anointing to their life. Now, you always have some bonehead that's so, so demonized, they'll rebuke you for trying to share Jesus with them. Don't worry about that. Right. Just go on to the next person. I said, go on to the next person. Paul had some guy withstand him so bad that, um, you know, that, that, that uh, a spirit of blindness came on him because he tried to stop the gospel from being preached. And a mist came on him, and he went away blind for a, se for a season. It wasn't, it wasn't sickness. A mist came on him. It was a supernatural sign that everybody that, that don't mess with the gospel. Hello? But think about your, see, we get, we get caught up in life. We get caught up with, with what's going on around us. We get caught up with, you know, we had some trouble in our marriage yesterday. We had trouble with our kids yesterday. I had trouble at work yesterday. Those are things you've got to deal with in life. Everybody's got to deal with those things in life. You've got to learn to deal with them in a way that they don't affect you. That you're able to go and get into the presence of God and get all that junk off of you. Hallelujah. That in his presence there's a fullness of joy. That you could come out of that time with the presence of God on you and go and sit down beside your neighbor who's having marriage problems and you just had an argument with your husband. And you're dealing with it. You're getting that straight. You got that straight. But you're able to sit down with them and, and, and the wisdom of God flow out of your life. Because you went and you got all that cleansed off of you. That out of the midst of, you know, maybe you're having trouble at work. Maybe there's stuff going on at work. Listen, folks, there's, there's stuff going on at work a lot of places. This stuff goes on at school. This stuff goes on everywhere. But you don't need to be shut down when you're not spiritually sensitive. You got to continue. Are you here? To spend time with the Lord. You got to continue to grow. You got to continue to go back to that place in the presence of God that when you can come out and you're out in the highways and the byways and, and instead of you going through the grocery store all consumed with the fact, you know, your kid got a D this week. He will survive. She will survive. Now, my son never got an A in math in high school. It wasn't even our goal. <laughs> Pass! <laughs> he takes summer school this summer. He gets an A! In math, college math. His grade came in. We thought, well, no, he's good. We just, just passed. We get at least a C. It transfers. It doesn't affect your GPA. So you kind of set the standard low. No, that was high. And A. Are you here? Glory to God. Why was I going to say that? I think just to pick on him. Yeah, you, you can't fall apart and not be, be available to God because you your kid got a bad grade. His report card does not mean you're a bad parent. Or her report card doesn't mean you're a bad parent. They will survive it. I did. Hello. I'm not even going to tell everything on myself. <laughs> it's, it's more fun. <laughs> oh, 
We drug that boy across the graduation line in high school. He goes, he gets an A in math. We used to beat our heads against the wall on math. And, you, know, you know what? He didn't want to do it. <laughs> the whole bottom line is he didn't want to do it because obviously when he got to college, he took college math and made an A on it. He could do it. He just didn't want to do it. And I understand that. That's why I thought I was. I was getting out of my, my I had, we, back in my day, we had this thing called the, the GT, uh, ET class. It wasn't the Ed Taylor class. It was the extra talented class. And that, for some reason, I was in there. Did that make you wonder about the people who run our school? <laughs> and it was Miss Claybrook, Miss Clay, and so our, our senior year, we had Miss Claybrook the last two periods of the day for this extra talented class. You got an extra GPA point on your grades. And I always got out during baseball season because we had to go line the field. We had to rake the field. I found every reason in the world not to be there. And Coach would always write the note because <laughs> he needed the work done. I don't think he really cared if you passed it. I just as long as he got the field rate and the lines put down. You can play ball this afternoon. And, and the, the grades will come out too late to stop you. All right. Why was I saying that? Yeah, your kids. kids. I drove my parents up a wall. Now, I had a, my, my sister, our parents, emer, our family's emerged family, so I had a stepsister, but we always called her sister. She, we were in the same grade. We, had, our, we were like six months apart in that same grade. And in this ET class, we had a big project for literature, and it was, you know, do some kind of, you know, art project or, you know, whatever for the Red Badge of Courage. John Steinbeck's the Red Badge of Courage. So she goes to the library for six weeks, three hours every day after school, and does this major project. She, she draws this thing, and she draws, and she works. Through. And they, my parents go, when are you, you going to start your project? I'll get it done. And that's where I know my son gets it. I'll get it done. I'll get it done. Night before it's due, my parents say, All right, when are you going to start? Uh, okay, I went in my room about an hour, drew a picture, turned it in. She turned her six-week, three-hour-a-day project in. Mine comes back with a 93. She comes back with a 98. Was I inspired? Yes, I can spend an hour and get a 93. It's worth it. <laughs> she spent six weeks longer, three hours a day, and only got five points more. It just wasn't worth it. <laughs> See, parents, they'll make it. I can promise you that. But, you know, you can't be gallant. I've seen parents who fall all the pieces in life, and they are no good for anybody else because their kids got a bad grade. And it messes with their self-esteem. You're there to guide them, to help them, to help train them, help lead them down the right path, but they'll make it. They might not like chemistry. <sighs> like, why? You know? Make it an elective. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, go do something else. Amen. Take a basket weaving. <laughs> We can't let the weights of the day, the things that come on you during the day, to rob you of your usefulness in the kingdom of God. God wants you to stay spiritually sensitive. That maybe you just got off the phone and, and they told you, you know, that we, we got to have a uh, parent-teacher meeting with you because your, your kid was dropping matches into a hole at the school and set it on fire. Not me, my brother that your son was throwing textbooks into the incinerator. Not me, my brother. <laughs> that the fire truck was called because the field behind your house was set on fire because somebody lit a firecracker. Not me, my brother. <laughs> Hello. There could be all kinds of things going on, but God wants you to say, you spent so much time with God, the the the, the, the Affairs of life can roll off your back like water off a duck's back. And you can go and minister life to people because you're spending time with God. Yeah, you've got to deal with those things. You've got you to address those things. You've got to train your children. You've got to deal with things they do that are boneheaded. You've got to deal with, you know, this. You've got to get them the help they need for having trouble in school. But it should not shut you down. You may have been told at work, you know, that uh, you're not getting the raise you were counting on. 
You might be told at work you might not have a job in three weeks. You might come to the church and there's no money in the church to pay any bills. Do we have to say, you got to be able to minister. You got to be able to look past all that and say, you know, that's in God's hands. I've, I've, I've taken some things with the church and just said, you know, Lord, you know what, here, here's the deal. <laughs> I can't do anything about it. So if you don't, go get me a U-Haul because I can't fix it. But I can't let that stop me from being able to, be able to effectively help people, to reach out and minister to people. Because why? Because if Satan knows that he can, if he can put a stranglehold on money and keep me from ministering to people, there'll they'll be a stranglehold on until Jesus comes back. He won't let go with everything. You know, you have to fight. You spend all your time fighting to get him to get his hands off of it, and you'll never minister to anybody. You've got to minister to people. Hallelujah. Talking to, I was talking to our pastor yesterday. We had we gone to Greenville. My, Janie's mama had hip replacement surgery this week. And so we drove down to Greenville yesterday to help do some cleaning up around the house and, uh, you know, make sure she was okay and everything. And her brother lives in, in, across in an apartment, but the house has a, a, a two-story garage, track the trailer bottom. It's, that's how high that. Why he built it that way, I don't know. Her day just built it. High enough to drive a track the trailer in the bottom base. I think he did just to do it, just because he could. And then put a full apartment up top, so that's where her brother lives. But they've taken care of her mama. But we went down, and uh, we stopped back on the way by uh, out of Greenville to see the attachment. Yeah, little Emily, Nathan's girlfriend. And then we stopped in, you know, and got talking, Pat, and we got talking about the old days, and Pastor John was talking about, you know, he was 22 when he started the church there. He said, I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. I said, yeah, but Pastor said, you were, you were called, you were anointed, and you were graced for a time like that. So sometimes we start looking back and we start thinking what mistakes we made, and he was anointed, called, and graced for that time because it was needed. It was a need. But speak encouragement, you know, instead of looking back and saying, probably shouldn't have done that. No. He was, he was called to do that. It was important that he do that. I believe that he was called to do that. Amen? So we can't get caught up with our own best that we can't, you know, I, I can say, man, you see what I'm going through. See, we can't do that. We've got to be able to speak, speak life and comfort and encouragement to other people. Amen? And, and speak words, you know, and acknowledge God working in them. We have to stay spiritually sensitive. And so be aware that while you're going through all the junk you're going through, there are people going through worse stuff. I said, there are people going through worse stuff. Somebody just lost their child. Somebody just lost their spouse. Are you here? Uh, one of my friends, her, his brother passed away about 10 years ago or so. Uh, they were in the, in the islands of Samoa. Is that right? It's in Samoa. He had started Rainbow Bible Training Center down there, and, and they pastored and ran a ministry down there for years and years. He, he, he died from ALS. And his wife's been single for a, a, a right good while. And I thought, oh, oh, the, and then she just remarried, she remarried, remarried a Samoan, you know. Well, she said, well, why shouldn't she do that? She shouldn't be single the rest of her life. Good gracious. And, and, and the ministry keeps going. The Bible school keeps going. Amen. Um, I, I just thought, man, you know, you, you, came, up, you came up short a few, of some money. They lost their husband. Came up short some money. They lost their wife. They came up short. They lost their kids. Hello. You came up short. They lost their job. They can't even provide for their family. Hello. You just got a raise. They lost their job. And you and and, and uh, you got upset because they uh, they double billed you for your 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 natural gas or something. We got to stay spiritually sensitive. Amen. You're upset because you, you didn't get the grade you wanted from your professor, and you know, you're going back to school, you didn't get the grade you wanted from your professor. Pastor didn't shake your hand and tell you how lovely you are today. The people that are hurting, there are things greater than what we're experiencing in the natural realm of life. That if we'll stay spiritually sensitive, 
we could still be used of God to minister to them, to help those people, to bring life to them, to be a blessing to them. And even the, and I'll tell you something, when you start being a blessing to other people and you stay sensitive to God and God starts using you, you know, all of a sudden some of the junk you've been going through just don't matter that much. God will find a way. Matter of fact, God's already got the answer. And I know some of you are going, and I, I, sometimes I do this. I sure would like to know what it is. Let me say this. Now, thanks be God that God would always cause us to have the victory in Jesus Christ our Lord. I know this, that whatever the answer is, it's victory. Amen. That I win. That I come out as the head, not the tail above only, not beneath. It may not look like it. I got a phone call the other day and, and, and about something, you know, financially, and I was like, now, just before, I was thinking, now the Lord's promised me everything's okay. Then you get the phone call. And you got a choice. I had a choice. Believe what the Lord had already told me or let the effects of that call, oh, God, I thought everything was all right. See, no, 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 the Lord said everything's all right. So what does that mean? Everything's all right. Does it look like it? Nope. Aren't you concerned? I had to cast it down. I, had, I went to the bathroom mirror and looked in the mirror and said, the Lord said everything's okay. I had to talk to myself. Because I wanted to go reach under the counter and get the white towel out and just come down to the church and just throw it right out in the middle of the platform. Say, I quit. But the Lord said everything's okay. So whose report will you believe? Y'all could get on, on, on together. <laughs> <clears throat> Whose report will you believe? We will believe report His report says, I am healed. His report says, I am filled. His report says, I am free. His report says, victory. <laughs> Whose report are you going to believe? Thank you. Amen. So we're going to have to get rid of the junk of life so we can stay in tune with God. So he can speak to us. He can direct us. He can use us. He can guide us. He can make us a blessing. Let me say something. Who are you going to believe? The people who say things about the church and about me? Or what the Lord said? And the Lord said everything's all right. I'm just too doggone tenacious with God to quit. I'm not looking for the exit strategy. I'm looking for the victory strategy. I'm not looking for how can we get out of this mess. I'm looking for how can we go forward and grow and do the things God's called us to do. How can we get the weight and the burden, you know, keep, keep casting that weight and that burden also that we can be sensitive to minister to people. People need ministry. People need help. Jesse told me yesterday, she was, we, were, we were kind of riding around, and she was, we were riding to Greenville. We were talking, she start, started talking about her blog. and the, the, Her blog is read by more people in Russia than anywhere else outside the United States. You know, it's, it's in America, she has about 10,000 American followers of her blog. I said, what? <laughs> She's got almost 1,700 Russian followers. People in Russia are reading her blog. Don't blog bull in this, no. Why should I be afraid of this man? I wrestle better. Yeah, you speak Ruski. The motherland. Anyway, she's got you know, about 1,600 in Russia. Got people in China, you know. And uh, you can touch people. If you'll, if you'll get rid of all your junk, you can touch people all over the world. There's means of doing it. Now, our, our television program, or our internet program goes all over the world. I don't know what kind of, you know, Bill, Bill keeps me numbers every once in a while. I just, I don't know what the numbers are right now. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, we went off the word of faith thing because they, they kept raising the prices, and we just weren't in a place to keep spending money for, for internet radio when we were able to put stuff out there for free. They took us off. People started calling and, and writing and wanted us back on. They put us back on at night for free because people want us. Well, Hallelujah. There was, 
We've got to keep the way, the, spend time with the Lord. Keep yourself fresh from the presence of God. Now, there's an interesting thing here. We're going to close right here. This has been a fireside chat day. It wasn't a real, wasn't a real preaching type sermon. Our next series, I, I don't know if we're going to get to it next week or the following week, we're going to talk about how, what, it, what does it really mean to be relevant? What does it really mean to be relevant? <coughs> Yeah, me too. I got the title. I don't know what's coming next. I got the title. The Lord gave me the title. So what, you know, he's, asking, he's been asking me that question. What does it mean, really mean to be relevant? I do know this. You'll never be relevant without the Word and without the Holy Ghost. You'll never be effective without the Word and without the Holy Ghost. Well, what about people who aren't baptized in the Holy Ghost? They're speaking tongues like what? I can tell you what. Baptist preachers get anointed by the Holy Ghost. Without, because they preach the word, and the word's anointed by the Holy Ghost. But you'll never be relevant without, relevant without that. So I don't, I don't get uptight about that. If they're preaching the word, they'll be anointed by the Holy Ghost to preach that word. Yeah. Amen? So don't, don't start shutting down people outside and categorizing them and saying they can't, be, they can't be relevant if they're not a Pentecostal. No, there's, there's a, listen, they're, they're good people who love the Lord, who preach the word, and they're anointed to preach the word. They got the Holy Ghost helping them. Amen? But um, I was trying to close this up, fireside chat. We have people to reach, people to minister to. And if we'll spend time with the Lord, spend time in his presence and keep growing with him, we'll be able to help people because there's a lot of stuff they don't know. I said, there's a lot of stuff that people just don't know. And we're called to do it. Amen. We have a job to do. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.